today we're talking uh, water pollution and the next several chapters as I mentioned before on water pollution, air pollution, global warming and ozone are really important chapters to really read and understand for the AP exam because keep in mind that almost a third of AP exam questions, multiple choice questions, come from pollution alone. So it's really important you have a good handle on all the terms in this chapter. And they're not hard, it's just a lot to remember. <clears throat> the, uh, the opening story, this picture here, is about the Chesapeake Bay. And the Chesapeake Bay is uh, between Virginia and Delaware, up in the Northeast, and there are lots of waterways that will contribute to the bay. It's the largest estuary in the U.S and has a lot of environmental issues. And a lot of it comes from, if not a huge majority, come from um, human activities. And it's from uh, animal feeding lots, so their manure gets um, either dumped purposely or leaks into the river waterways. Sediment pollution is an issue. Um, pharmaceuticals getting in there, even birth control. Um, had been getting into the water which was causing severe issues with some organisms that turned out to be hermaphrodites so both male and female parts due to the human uh, dumping uh -oh. there we go so what is water pollution contamination of streams rivers lakes oceans or groundwater with substances produced through human activities and that negatively affect organisms a good uh, or an important point to remember are the two types of sources from which water pollution comes from they are always asked on the AP exam so know these two terms point sources and non point sources point sources mean that this particular polluter I can actually point to and say yes that is it that is what is causing the pollution so it could be a particular factory that empties um, out into the water it could be um, a specific animal manure area um, so it, I'll go back to that in a second. And a non-point source means that it's a very diffuse or large area that you could, it's very hard to point to. So, it, or it could be a series of places that are contributing the pollution, so you can't really narrow it down or target who it is. So that could be an entire farming region. It could be an entire region of factories that you can't tell where the source exactly is. Um, but you know around about where it's coming from. The problem with those is that because they're hard to target, it's hard for the EPA to say you're responsible and you need to clean it up. So a good hint is that a point source is singular. If they were asking you a multiple choice question and they said which one of these is a point source a pollutant, if you see one that is singular, it's more than likely the point source. If it's multiple, like animal lagoons or farming areas, so plural, those are more likely to be non-point sources. So there you go, a particular pipe that is releasing pollutants into a body of fresh water is a point source. Excuse me, it doesn't have to be fresh water, it can be ocean water too. And a non-point source, you can see this large farming area um, where it would be hard to point exactly to the source. So what are the different types of water pollutants? Human and animal waste, inorganic substances, organic compounds, and non-chemical pollutants. Here is a, a river in China that are greenish black from pollution from factories. And so they could be so polluted that uh, you could light it on fire just like in a civil action. So that's pretty gross. Human wastewater is obviously a problem um, mostly in developing countries, but in developed countries 
uh, human wastewater is also released into fresh bodies and the EPA does give them permission to do so. Well, I shouldn't say the EPA, but factories are um, able to do so and I'll get to that in a moment. So water produced by human activities such as human sewage from toilets, gray water from bathing and washing clothes or dishes is considered wastewater. And in developing countries, a lot of times people will wash their clothes, take a bath, and go to the bathroom all in the same area, in the same body of water. So you can imagine how nasty and contaminated that water is and how dangerous it could be to consume it or to even really be near it. Why scientists are concerned about wastewater are the oxygen demanding waste like bacteria. When you have decomposition in water, uh, bacteria in decomposition consume a lot of oxygen and so that creates an oxygen sag curve and when you have um, not a whole lot of oxygen, well then obviously uh, organisms are not going to be able to respire and they will die as the water becomes hypoxic which means very low oxygen or anoxic which means without. Nutrients are released from wastewater decomposition so such as nitrogen and phosphorus which are the two that we've learned about before um, which makes the water more fertile causing eutrophication. We've talked about eutrophication and that's more of over fertilization. Oh, I guess that'll be on the next slide. So when you look at dissolved oxygen content in parts per million, you want it between eight and nine when you're looking at water quality. So see, this is why I really wanted to um, get dissolved oxygen uh, measurements in your eco bottle labs because it's important to see if it's a good quality water and that this ecosystem is self-sustaining and being efficient at um, removing waste but also not depleting oxygen. So if you see that, you know, if a question on the AP exam said, hey, the, the, the DO is at three, is this good water quality or bad, you know that it's going to be bad. Bio, uh, excuse me, biochemical oxygen demand is called the BOD and that's how much oxygen a, an amount of water needs to use over a period of time at a specific temperature. Can you hear me? Sorry, I thought my microphone was getting weird. Okay, so if you have a low BOD, that says that the water is less polluted and higher BOD values indicate that it's more polluted. When bodies of water have high oxygen demand because of microbial decomposition, the amount of O2 for other organisms is low. So take a look at this oxygen sag curve. This picture is not in your textbook as far as I know. This was in an old textbook. Um, but questions have appeared on the AP exam about oxygen sag curves. So if you notice in your clean zone, the BOD is low, so that means that it's nice clean generally clean water and the dissolved oxygen is at around eight okay now n look at what's happened here now I've got a point source of effluent or just nasty stuff that's been deposited into a water body and so as the um, effluent or polluted water enters the water source um, the bacteria are going to try to consume it and break it down, which leads to here that that needs to more oxygen demand, but the oxygen is getting consumed by that bacteria. So after a while, when the decomposition is starting to finish and the pollution is starting to diffuse, then it'll start to recover and then you have clean water again. Eutrophication is the abundance of fertility. So again, over fertilization, and we've talked about this several times. Eutrophication or the adding of, of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorin, phosphorus, like nitrates and phosphates, which you'll get from fertilizers, pesticides, um, and other chemicals, that can cause the rapid growth of algae, 
which eventually dies and then so the microbes need more oxygen they consume the oxygen and then it causes the oxygen levels to decrease for the other organisms and remember too in chapter 9 we talked about a eutrophic lake which means it was an older lake that's been around for a while the water is cloudy it's dirty it's got a lot of algae and decomposition in the water common diseases that come from human wastewater include those there cholera is a big one and a lot of these um, of course are in the developing countries notice these that half of diarrheal and malaria deaths could be prevented with safe drinking water and proper sanitation and hygiene so that means not taking a poop in the river 42 percent of the world's population lacks access to proper sanitation and over half of them live in the two most populous countries in the world china and india if scientists want to check out if a body of water has disease causing pathogens they often look for fecal coliform bacteria such as e coli because e coli will li lives in our intestines and if we poop in the water or if just human waste or animal waste gets into the water system and um, shows up in the test e coli shows up in a water quality test we know that human or animal waste is in the water so notice there that a count of zero coliform bacteria is acceptable for drinking water but it could be quite high at a beach or a river meaning you could still technically swim in it you just wouldn't want to consume it um, and due to E. coli um, infestations if you will in water bodies sometimes the government has shut down a body of water from being able to be swam in due to high levels of human waste well how do you treat human and animal wastewater there are two ways one is a septic system and if you live out in the country or know someone who does they probably do have a septic system I know my family does uh, who live in the country in Poteet and so here's a diagram you see of a septic system you have a container that will receive the wastewater from the house and what at least hap happens in my family's house is that you can't put toilet paper or anything except the actual waste in um, the, the toilets because it will go into the um, septic tank and start to uh, clog it up in the tank or in the wastewater container anything that floats to the top and you know what I'm talking about is called scum and anything that sinks and is more dense than water is called sludge and then that middle layer which is just regular water is called septage the septage contains bacteria but it also contains um, pathogenic organisms so disease potential disease causing organisms nitrogen and phosphorus through gravity uh, the water will flow through pipes in the lawn which is called the leach field the good thing about um, septic systems is that no electricity is used in these things they just rely on the gravity um, the pipes contain small little holes so that the water slowly seeps out and will spread across the leach field so what happens um, is that that septage or the the water is filtered out and filtered through the soil the harmful pathogens settle out become part of the sludge and then can be decomposed by uh, microorganisms and you might have seen in commercials that a lot of times they have that ridex and that's basically adding bacteria to eat away at the sludge because if you don't you have to have it pumped out every five to ten years if you don't it gets backed up and then you have a poop smell coming from your lawn and that can be really expensive to fix for people in metropolitan areas such as us living in San Antonio we depend on sewage treatment plants and there are um, two types of main treatments that they will go through the first is the primary treatment and that's when 
all the solids will settle and dry out or be dried and that's the sludge. Water is removed and that will reduce the volume of the whole thing and bacteria is added just like the Ridex I talked about in order to try and consume some of that waste. Um, the goal is for, for primary treatment is to get the solid waste material out. Um, when the sludge is settled out of the wastewater and been treated then the remaining water goes through secondary and the goal for this is to use bacteria to break down 85 to 90 percent of the organic matter in the water and convert it to carbon dioxide and nitrogen and phosphorus. So basically what will happen is the water is aerated or air oxygen is pumped into the, the water to promote bacteria growth so that it will decompose the organic matter. The last step is for it to be disinfected with either chlorine, ozone, or UV light. Then that water is released into a nearby, nearby river or lake. The problem is, is that with secondary treatment, there's still nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. And we've already established that nitrogen and phosphorus are good nutrients for algae growth. And so when they are pumping this treated wastewater, it still has all this nutrients that can lead to eutrophication. Um, and so companies are trying to get rid of the nitrogen and phosphorus through tertiary treatment and that is either adding more chemicals to try to get rid of them or adding different bacteria that are genetically modified or natural that will consume more nitrogen and phosphorus. So denitrifying bacteria that we've seen before in the nitrogen cycle and phosphorus organisms that will actually absorb and hold on to phosphorus are also used. So that's tertiary. So we can get as much of the nutrients out of the um, wastewater. So I will let you, you can pause so that you can look at this you do need to know these. I will tell you that one of the AP FRQ prompts um, from a few years ago asked the students to very um, descriptively state what happens through primary and secondary treatment. Probably since they asked that just a few years ago or several years ago, they wouldn't ask that exact question, but you need to know what goes on at both primary and secondary treatment of wastewater. Um, manure lagoons. This is a manure lagoon here and so that is just animal waste um, that is being dumped into a giant pond that has been lined with rubber to try to get it from seeping into the groundwater. Um, and again they add bacteria to try to break down the, the organic waste in it and once it's been dried out um, they turn it into pellets for gardening um, or fertilizers. So you could imagine that a lot of times um, pollution is happening because there are breaks in the the liner and that could get into the groundwater. Let me go back uh, for a second to the human wastewater part. These treatment plants are very critical to our health because they take away a lot of the harmful organic matter and pathogens which is why we don't worry about waterborne illnesses as much as developing countries do who you know will go to the bathroom and wash their hands and wash their clothes and bathe um, in the same body of water. However, a lot of times raw sewage which is just urine and poop filled water could actually be directly pumped into rivers and lakes and what happens is that when there are uh, periods of really heavy rain, older sewage treatment plants get uh, storm water from those rains and so then it overflows. So when they when they have an overflow to the, they can't handle that capacity, the, uh, the treatment plant is allowed to bypass the normal protocols and actually pump water directly into a nearby lake or um, stream. And so what happens is that you could release a billion gallons of raw sewage um, into surrounding 
body wa uh, water bodies and this has happened in Indianapolis as they've seen and as well as the Chesapeake Bay that's one of the reasons why it was so polluted so it does happen in developed countries all right so we're past the human and animal wastewater and now we talk about other substances such as heavy metals we've talked about heavy metals before as um, as impairments to human health. Lead is one that will damage the nervous system, so that's why we have unleaded gasoline. Paint no longer contains lead, as that was um, giving children mental retardation. Um, but lead can still contaminate water because if water is going through old pipes, those pipes still contain lead. And, um, and so those little bits of lead can still get into the water. Arsenic is a naturally occurring um, heavy metal. So it's found in the Earth's crust. It's found when um, you mine in mining operations. And, but it readily dissolves in groundwater. And so um, mining, like for coal, can release arsenic into the water. And that is associated with uh, cancer. So there's a map that I'm going to show you right there that will uh, show you the highest concentrations of arsenic are generally found in the Midwest in the West. Um, and that's when they're found in well water. And sometimes these illnesses can take up to 10 years or more uh, after exposure to develop. So sometimes it's years after you've even been exposed before you notice that there's a problem. Um, and so the EPA has lowered the, the limit to, I'm sorry, where was I? Oh, has, has lowered the safe limit. So they put limits on how much is actually acceptable. And we talked about that briefly when we talked about the risk chapter and the toxicity, that how much risk are you um, willing to accept in your water and arsenic is one of those things where they you know it was set at some level of 50 and then they lowered it to 10 then they lowered it to 5 and then it had to be back up to 10 um, because of a lot of pressure so there could still potentially be arsenic in your groundwater um, but a lot of times it is if you're going to be near mining operations so if you look once again San Antonio, not such a bad area to live in because there aren't so many mines here. Mercury is a naturally occurring heavy metal. Um, most of the time we'll get it as it falls from the sky from burning fossil fuels like coal. Remember coal is the dirtiest fossil fuel to burn and uh, mercury levels have increased in the oceans because of the mercury falling down um, from the smokestacks of coal mines, excuse me, um, electric uh, power plants from burning coal. You can also have mercury from burning garbage, medical dental supplies from all the metals in there. And this is a big one because it will bioaccumulate in aquatic food chains. And we've seen that um, as you don't want to eat too much large predatory fish like tuna because uh, it bioaccumulates in the larger fish and mercury has been known to cause nervous system damage. The other one that um, that will bioaccumulate is DDT, that that has been well documented and it was because that it bioaccumulated in organisms and made the shells of birds go soft so that meant that fewer birds were being hatched which means populations crashed um, and it was uh, the book Silent Spring that uh, started environmentalism which banned which led to the banning of DDT so do make sure that you read page three, 392 about pesticides there's a little too much um, in the the reading to put on the slideshow um, acids are also released into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels so you have sulfur dioxide and nitrous dioxide that gets released from burning coal. Um, when they get released into the air, they're converted to sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid does burn skin 
in concentrated amounts. So if you have wet, this is important here, wet acid deposition is in the form of acid rain. So acid rain does have sulfuric acid in it. Dry acid depo, uh, deposition occurs when the gases or uh, solid particles attach to soils, plants, and water. And what happens is that that will reduce the pH, because remember, the lower the pH, the more acidic. So the more acidic the water, um, the more lethal it could be to some species, as that takes them out of their um, zone. Their, um, oh, I forgot the word. The, the zone that they prefer to live in. Um, We'll also get into the acid deposition a lot more in air pollution, but just know um, the difference between wet acid deposition and dry acid deposition. Mercury production, I'm not really sure why that's that important here. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna pause this. Oh yeah, so going back to, to, to mercury, um, a lot of it is coming from, um, most of it is coming from the burning of fossil fuels, which is about two-thirds of that. Um, and then notice where a lot of it is coming from. Mercury production is coming, um, a majority of it, from um, Asia. Um, part of the problem, and, and like I said before, when you don't want to eat too much predatory fish, like tuna, but it's also shellfish or sushi, you need to be careful that you don't eat too much sushi, sushi um, at one time, especially if it's tuna sushi. And I'm not a sushi eater, so I don't know what's really a lot. But um, if you look in your textbook, it said that in 2008, a reporter for the New York Times purchased tuna sushi from 20 locations in New York City. And after analysis found that at most restaurants, a diet of just six pieces per week would exceed the EPA standard for human consumption of mercury. So that could mean it's affecting you, and particularly if you are a woman, that would be a teratogen, meaning it's causing harm to the fetus. So one of the, the steps that they're trying to do to get rid of mercury is to um, uh, try and reduce the emissions for um, mercury or other pollutants in the scrubbers, which are uh, in smokestacks of power plants to try to, to reduce those uh, solid particles from emitting. Um, here, this is an underground mine that was abandoned and uh, so as they were mining away it's, the land started to subside or to sink and as you have the groundwater that runs along the top you see that it's turned like this rusty color and that is coming from the pyrite. Pyrite is iron uh, FES2, so iron sulfide. And when it mixes with water, it will break down into iron and hydrogen. And um, iron and hydrogen will make the water more acidic. So that's pretty nasty. So mining um, has a great deal of influence on pollution. This is showing you. Um, how synthetic or human-made organisms are uh, organisms uh, products are making their way into water systems and if you see there steroids are making their way into water systems a lot of that is when you throw away things down the toilet and that's one reason why you should never deposit old medicines into the, the water system um, you shouldn't uh, throw away birth controls, pills. That's a big one too. The reproductive hormones are coming from birth control pills that are being, sometimes they're being thrown away properly and then with, um, but maybe the, the liner in the landfill leaks. Um, you never really know exactly what's happening to it once you throw it away. But um, uh, hormonal drugs, antibiotics, non-prescription drugs like Tylenol, ibuprofen, all of this is getting into the waterways and not only contaminating it for human consumption, but contaminating it for other organisms. Industrial compounds are another type of water pollutant, um, and industrial compounds are those chemicals that are used in manufacturing. And unfortunately, 
many were dumped into bodies of water directly and purposely uh, for a way to dispose of them, which is just insane. Um, an example of uh, industrial compounds being uh, d disposed of was in Ohio um, on the Cuyahoga River, and industries had dumped um, their waste products for over a hundred years and had killed all the animal life that was in the river and eventually caught fire several times um, in the 60s. And so it's much cleaner now because of legislation, but just imagine how incredibly polluted that water was back then. PCBs are polychlorinated biphenyls, and those are used in plastics. And although it's no longer manufactured, it has um, a long persistence. So it stays in the area um, for years and years and, and can be carcinogenic or cancer-causing when it's ingested. Um, a big case of it was when GE, General Electric, had uh, dumped millions, a, a mil, over a million pounds of PCBs into the Hudson River, and the EPA demanded that they dredge it uh, to dig it up, um, which they fought because they said it was going to stir up the sediments and then increase the, the PCBs in the water again, but the EPA won, and so they did have to dredge the river to try and dig it up. Uh, PBDEs are polybrominated diphenyl ethers, and those are used as flame retardants. So they're put in clothes, they're put in building materials or furniture to obviously make them less flammable. Um, but somehow they were getting into waterways because they were uh, showing uh, PBDEs in fish, in birds, and in breast milk, and that can lead to brain damage. So uh, many types of those compounds have been banned. Oil pollution uh, we're a little bit more familiar with, and what this graphic is showing you is where the sources of oil come from in the ocean. So in A is North American marine waters, and notice that 62% is a natural seep. So what scientists have discovered is that um, oil can naturally seep from the bottom of the ocean. And we have to consider that when we also have spills or leaks from industry because there's that combined um, human and natural um, release of oil. So from consumption of products, from the transportation of the petroleum itself, from actually extracting petroleum from the ocean floor um, will cause leaks and spills. And then the on the right is the worldwide. Annually 322,000 pounds of oil leaks in North American waters those are from the oil platforms, usually in the Gulf. Um, but worldwide, it's actually worse and can go from the same amount, 322,000 pounds, to over a million pounds of oil in other parts of the world where the uh, rules are less stringent. In 2010, you're probably more familiar with the BP uh, explosion um, off the Deepwater Horizon platform in the Gulf of Mexico. And there, uh, between the time that the explosion in April until they actually finally sealed it in August, it released about 206 million gallons of oil into the Gulf. And so you can imagine how much uh, it contaminated beaches, the wildlife, um, the freshwater estuaries along the coasts, and so, and a, uh, did I say the animal life? And of course, the animal life. Um, one real big famous one when I was a kid was the Exxon Valdez that happened in 1989. In fact, it was the 25th anniversary this week um, in March um, in which it spilled 11 million gallons of oil and killed hundreds of thousands of seabirds and otters and seals and even killer whales. So they've been cleaning it up now for 25 years and it's still ongoing and they estimate it's going to take uh, about a hundred years for it to fully break down. And that's one of the things we have to think about 
when oil is naturally seeping into the uh, water from the ocean itself, from the ocean floor, that um, over time it will finally disperse and be remediated. But then you add in human-induced oil pollution and it's just going to take a lot longer. So there you see, um, this is from the Exxon Valdez spill. So how do you clean up oil pollution? Well, there's a couple of ways. Um, and they started experimenting a lot after the Exxon Valdez because of how much was released, although it was only 11 million and BP was 206 million. But um, they tried to contain it using booms, which are these um, plastic containers that just float on the surface. Because keep in mind, oil is does not mix with water. So oil will float on top of water, but it also makes this really thick layer. So you have to make sure that those containment booms um, will be, I guess, thick enough to try to block the oil from spreading. So once they're able to contain that in an area, they will try and suck it up with vacuums. Um, otherwise, they've tried to apply chemicals that try to make it disperse before it hits the shoreline and then cause damage to the um, ecosystems. So although that could be effective, think of it kind of like spreading the bacteria to break down solid waste. Um, it's still a chemical and so the chemical could be toxic to the wildlife. And then they also um, have genetically engineered bacteria that would consume oil from natural seeps. So they decided to get those to try to uh, eat up human spilled oil. Other water pollutants include uh, solid waste. So again, don't pollute, don't be throwing away um, any kind of trash into the water. Obviously things will uh, contaminate the water. Sediment pollution is not one that people normally think about, but the Chesapeake Bay up in Virginia does have that issue of sediment pollution. So when you start to build and develop cities, especially along coastlines, you are taking away trees which take away roots which anchor some of that soil and so the soil will easily wash away and then they go into the water bodies that move and so they could empty out and make um, the deltas very clogged with sediment just like the Mississippi is right now. Um, they become brown, they become ugly and that reduces productivity of plants. Thermal pollution is also another one when um, when they empty out heated water from industry up out into open bodies of water, fresh or ocean water. So because that's out of that range of tolerance, oh, tolerance was the word I was looking for earlier. Um, because the heated water takes those organisms out of their range of tolerance for temperature, many will die. And then noise pollution is also considered a pollutant in water because of ships interfe interfering with whale communication. Um, this is a river in Indonesia that is just loaded with trash. I mean, that's just disgusting. Can you imagine? This is um, the Santa Ana River in California. And so it's going out into the Pacific. So you can see all that sediment that has been um, emptied out and it forms this delta. That's a lot of sediment that should not be there and it's mostly a result of all the development going on that causes all that loose soil to be washed away. Um, this is in Iceland and a lot of people in Iceland will um, go in the, in the bodies of water that are heated by geothermal energy. So energy from the, the earth and so they have <laughs> this water here that is by a nuclear reactor and as I mentioned before when it comes to power plants whether it's coal or especially nuclear they have to cool down the water that they have used to heat up because remember they turn they they heat up the water to to cause steam to turn the turbines to turn the generators to generate electricity well, that water has to be cooled down. So when they use um, those cooling tanks and after it's um, 
cooled, they return it to natural bodies of water, but it's still pretty hot. Water laws, these are important. The Clean Water Act of 1972 uh, was established to protect uh, fish, shellfish, and wildlife. And keep in mind that it does not include the protection of groundwater, which is what we get our drinking water from. So it really focused mostly on the chemical properties of the surface waters. The Safe Drinking Water Act then was established later to set the standards for safe drinking water. And that's where they put those acceptable um, contaminant levels for substances in water and groundwater for us to drink. And so here you can see some micro microorganisms. This is for drinking water. So this is, um, and, and notice that it's in parts per billion, not parts per million. So no fecal coliform bacteria is acceptable for drinking water because then you would be drinking human poop. Um, but notice that arsenic is, is acceptable. Some parts of mercury, some parts of benzene, atrazine um, are allowed and considered tolerated in drinking water. And this is also how um, waterways have been impaired. So just take a look at those charts. Developing countries are still in the process of industrializing, so they have less restrictive environmental laws, have less money to fund water quality improvements like waste treatment plants. So what's really important in the developing countries is to try to get them some clean potable water and some facilities to treat um, especially human wastewater, and to try to get them from not bathing and washing and pooping in their waterways. But as would be expected, as a country becomes more um, industrialized, it becomes more affluent, regulations will improve, sanitation improves, hygiene improves, so water quality will improve. All right, this is the end of chapter 14. Thanks. Just let me know if you have any questions.